This morning, I wanted to share a teaching with you that's been stirring in my heart, friends, a little bit of a deviation from our series that we've been teaching on the authority of God's word. But I want to teach this morning on living a lifestyle of faith. Uh, again, living a lifestyle of faith. And I had it in my heart to teach a message of encouragement. I want to encourage you with these things, friends, uh, to help you develop and cultivate a consistent lifestyle of faith, understanding uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, uh, for we walk by faith and not by sight, friends. Even though we're very familiar with that verse of scripture, friends, we can't become familiar with that verse of scripture and its meaning, uh, understanding that we live, the just shall live by faith, that we are called to live by faith, not according to what we see and what we experience in this natural world. And so I believe that this is the message for today that the Lord would like for me to uh, communicate it to the hearts of, of God's people to encourage you in your walk with the Lord. Let's just dig in here. And I want to go through a number of scriptures and just lay some foundation here, friends, to serve as a reminder uh, of the need for us to live by faith on a daily basis and to create a lifestyle of faith, not just something that we do on Sunday morning during this time or once during the week, during midweek Bible study, friends, but faith is a lifestyle for us. We're going to talk about that today. Let's start with Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Uh, right, Paul writes here, he says, so then faith comes by hearing. Faith comes by hearing, friends. I want to remind you that faith has to come. I've, I've taught before uh, that faith does not have a shelf life. You cannot store up faith, friends. In other words, today's faith won't work for tomorrow. Yesterday's faith doesn't work for today. Faith does not have a shelf life. It cannot be stored up. Faith comes. Faith flows. It has to continually flow and be active and operative in our life on a moment by moment basis, friends. So note the tense here. So then faith comes by hearing, not because you heard, not because you heard once upon a time or you heard that before. You've heard this teaching before. Faith comes by hearing, active tense, ongoing basis. But then listen at this part. I want to focus on this. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God and hearing by the word of God. So I want to take a different look, a slightly different look at this verse than we're used to. Um, the word of God says here that hearing by the word of God, hearing or your ability to hear, friends, comes from the word of God. We tend to think that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, that faith does come by the word of God. But listen at this verse more carefully. Look at this more carefully. He says, so then faith comes by hearing. And you can also say, and hearing comes by the word of God. Faith comes by the word of God, but hearing also comes by the word of God. Hearing your ability to hear God, it comes from the word of God, friends. We're living in a time, the reason I'm taking some time to teach this is because we can no longer assume that God's people have the ability, that folks have the ability to hear God anymore. I believe that there are many, many of God's people at this very moment, I can see it, uh, that many of God's people are spiritually deaf. They are not hearing God. Faith comes by hearing, but hearing also comes by the word of God. Many of God's people have lost their capacity to hear. Uh, remember, Jesus would always say, let those who have ears to hear, let them hear. Friends, think about this for a moment that if uh, I think the first Tuesday of every month or so, we hear this tornado siren uh, here in the Midwest, friends, they have uh, tsunami sirens out on the coast, friends. Think about uh, for a moment here, if the siren, if the tornado or the tsunami siren is blaring, friends, because there is an actual tornado or there is a tsunami coming, coming, friends. But if folks can't hear it, friends, they're as good as gone. Their lives are going to be destroyed because even though the alarm is being sounded, if people can't hear the alarm, their lives are going to be in great peril and great danger, friends. And, you know, Joel tells us to blow the trumpet in Zion to sound the alarm and God's holy mountain to sound the alarm among God's people, friends. I'm telling you, the alarm has been sounded. I'm sounding the alarm. Many of God's people, uh, men and women of God who are preaching the gospel or preaching the gospel have been sounding the alarm. But I'm telling you, there are many of God's people are spiritually deaf and they cannot hear the alarm. They cannot hear the message to be awakened that this is the time, friends, to watch and to be vigilant and to be prepared for the coming of the Lord. People who don't know the word of God have no ability to hear God because he speaks through his word. So then faith comes by hearing and get this and hearing or the ability to hear comes by the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. 
So if if you are not, uh, let's just say, intimately engaged with the word of God, friends, you lose when you're not intimately engaged with the word of God. You lose your capacity to hear. You lose your ability to hear. Look at this verse of scripture again. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It does not say that faith comes by hearing the Holy Spirit. Big deal, friends. Very, very important. This verse does not say that faith comes by hearing the Holy Spirit. It says that faith comes by hearing the word of God. Let me ask you, how do you really, really know if the voice that is speaking to you is the Holy Spirit? You or if that voice is a demonic spirit, friends, how do you know the difference? The only way for you to know the difference between the Holy Spirit, uh, the, a demonic spirit and your own voice, your own desires and presuppositions, friends, your own heart concerning certain things, friends. The only way for you to determine which voice is which, friends, is by the word of God. The only way for you to tell the difference between the voice of the Holy Spirit and the demonic spirit Paul tells us that that Satan comes as an angel of light. Friends, the only way for you to determine between the Holy Spirit and a demonic spirit speaking to you is through the word of God. It does not say that faith comes by hearing the Holy Spirit. And I'm saying this because as a pastor, you sometimes talk with God's people and uh, listen at this phrase. You know where the Lord told me. The Lord told me. James, pastor James, the Lord said, God told me, God told me, God told me. And sometimes, folks, I listen at, at people and I say, OK, what you're what you're saying that God told you does not line up with his word. Well, the Holy Spirit told me, friends, the only way for you to protect yourself from error, because God told you the scripture does not faith, say that faith comes by hearing the Holy Spirit. It says that faith comes by hearing the word of God. Very important for the uh, relativistic humanistic friends, these egalitarian times and teachings, these inclusive teachings that we're hearing right now in society, you must know the word of God to see to it that you're accurately hearing the voice of the Lord. Whenever, when Jesus spoke with a demonic spirit, Satan himself uh, in the wilderness, friends, he always responded, it is written, it is written, it's in the word of God, it's in the word of God. Jesus never said the Holy Spirit told me or I think or I believe or I believe God is leading me. Every time Jesus encountered a demonic force, he would speak the word of God only and say, it is written. There are far too many of God's people today uh, quoting spiritual things and spiritual ideas and premonitions about what they think the Holy Spirit is telling them, but these things are not scriptural. And I'm telling you folks, that is the only way to protect ourselves from error. Let's get to work here. John chapter 17, verse 17. One statement, and then we're gonna come back to this passage. Uh, Jesus makes this statement in John 17, 17. He says, praying to the father, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Sanctify them by your truth. Set them apart by your truth. Your word is truth. What is written is truth as it is written in God's word. That is the truth that sanctifies us and sets us apart is the truth of God's word. Take a look here. The word sanctify is a Greek word, hagiadzo, hagiadzo. Sanctify means to purify or consecrate. It means to venerate. We're going to come back to that in a second. It also means to separate from profane things and dedicate to God. Come on, folks. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. It means to separate from profane things and to dedicate to God. It means to cleanse externally, to purify internally by renewing of the soul. That's a loaded definition of what it means uh, to be sanctified by the truth of God's word. And I want to just focus on that term venerate. Uh, that, that's a very important word that once upon a time, the word venerate was a part of a significant part of the Christian faith. Maybe you hear that term more, uh, more often in the, uh, in the, in the Catholic community, uh, venerate friends. But we've gotten away from this in Protestant uh, contemporary, contemporary Christianity, friends, and we need to reclaim this word to venerate. Why? Because the word venerate means to respect, to greatly respect and to revere. To venerate means to greatly respect and to revere. And when the word of God says, sanctify them by your truth, your word is truth. Within that meaning, hagiazo, it means to venerate. It, it has to do with this idea of us uh, returning to this place in this posture where we greatly respect and we revere the person of God. And again, I think that this term is missing in contemporary Christianity. Uh, we live in a time today, sadly, where, where Christians, we believe that our rights 
our feelings, our rights, our opinions, our sociopolitical ideologies, friends, all of those things, we esteem them much more than we venerate God more than we uh, respect and reverence God. We revere his person, friends. We now hold our opinions, our feelings, our thoughts, our political ideas in much higher esteem than, in higher esteem than we do to venerate God, friends. Let me tell you how this is important. As we're talking about living a lifestyle of faith, friends, there are some things that, that, that I would perhaps like to do, could be some things I feel like doing and some things that are legal for me to do that I won't do and cannot do because I venerate God, because I respect and I, I reverence God. I fear God, the fear of the Lord, because I reverence and revere and respect the Lord. Friends, there are things I can do. It's legal for me to do. I want to do that. I don't do and I cannot do simply because I venerate and I respect God. Friends, this is this is the, the, the making and the context of holiness, friends, in terms of us revering God. And I'm afraid that this idea of veneration has 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 left the church is no longer part of our nomenclature is no part no longer part of contemporary Christianity friends just people of God reverencing the presence of God having great respect for the presence of God I sometimes say that everything legal is not regal everything legal is not regal friends what do I mean by regal I'm talking about the kingdom of God I'm talking about royalty I'm talking about the presence of God on earth here on earth as it is in heaven. It's how Jesus tells us to pray, friends. Everything legal in this world is not regal concerning the kingdom of God. Always remember that when it comes to veneration in terms of having respect and having reverence for God. So how does sanctif sanctification happen? It happens by the truth of God's word. Let's go back to John chapter 17, starting at verse 13 and read from the New Living Translation. Jesus is praying here. He says, now I am coming to you, praying to the Father, I told them many things while I was with them in this world so they would be filled with my joy that Jesus speaks to us, has spoken to us by his word. He says here so that they would be filled so they would be filled with his joy. Friends, that's a big deal. In the in the days of depression and discouragement, friends, in a time where folks are really, really uh, many people are at their lowest and feeling their worst friends out of depression and discouragement uh, because of the times in which we live. Jesus says, I've told my people some things so that they would be filled with my joy. Friends, the joy of the Lord is associated again with the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. You got to be able to hear God's call and God's word concerning joy in your life. If you're going to live and walk in the fullness of the Lord's joy. Verse verse 14. Jesus says this, I have given them your word. I have given them your word. Come on, folks. I want us to come back to the sanctity and the importance of the word of God. The one thing that Jesus has given us is the word of the father. Seems that we pursue all other kinds of things in life, friends, and we ignore, we neglect his word. And the one thing that Jesus gives every believer is the word of God. Listen at this. And the world hates them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. Verse 15. I am not asking you, speaking to the father, to take them out of the world. Don't take them away from the mess and the problems and the hardships of life. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world. Friends, come on. We were made for the mess and the problems, the tough times of life. We were made for the day of adversity, as the word of God says. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world. But to keep them safe from the evil one, verse 16, they do not belong to this world any more than I do. As a Christ follower, you and I, we do not belong to this world. Verse 17, make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Make them holy. How? Sanctified. How? By your holy truth. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word. Your word is truth. Verse 18, just as you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world, friends. This is a big, big deal. Such a vital scripture for this time. If we're going to live a lifestyle of faith and be sanctified unto God, friends, we've got to be able to hear this, that hearing the voice of God, hearing his word, it comes from being sanctified or being set apart to the Lord. Let's read John 17, beginning at verse 14. 
from the message translation, which is a paraphrase translation. John 17, 14 from the message Bible says this. Uh, Jesus says, I gave them your word. The godless world hated them because of it, because they did not join the world's ways. Oh, my goodness. What an important verse of scripture for us to meditate on. He gave us his word. But then the ungodly or the godless world hates us because Jesus has given us his word. And he says, for this reason, because they did not join the world's ways. I've shared with you before that term world in the Greek language is the word cosmos, K-O-S-M-O-S, uh, which means this world's system, this world's way of doing things. I gave them your word, word the, the godless world, the godless cosmos hated them because of it, because they did not join the world's ways or they did not operate according to the cosmos or the world's system. Verse 15, just as I didn't join the world's ways, I'm not asking that you take them out of the world, but that you guard them from the evil one. Verse 16, they are no more defined by the world and the cosmos than I am defined by the world. Make them holy, consecrated with the truth. Your word is consecrating truth. Verse 18, in the same way that you gave me a mission in the world, I give them a mission in the world, friends. Big, big deal in verse 16 that Jesus says that my people, those who are following me, those who belong to the Father, are no more defined by the world. We are not defined by the world's system, by the cosmos, friends. We are not to be defined by the ways of the world. We're defined by the truth of God's word. Uh, so in the world, look at this, 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 10, verse 32 from the New Living Translation. Very, very important revelation here. Verse 32, Paul writes this, don't give offense to Jews or Gentiles, interesting, or the church of God. Jews, Gentiles, or the church of God. The church of God is the word ecclesia. Take a look at this. Ecclesia, that word for church, the Greek word for church, it means the distinctly Christian community of saints in heaven and on earth. An assembly of people called out into a council for the purpose of deliberating. Very important definition of what it means to be part of the ecclesia, the community of God in the earth, but also in heaven, the great cloud of witnesses. Uh, folks, he gives uh, three distinctions here. He talks about Jews, Gentiles, and thirdly, the church of God. And it's a council to deliberate. Now, when you deliberate, that means to, to carefully consider, to very carefully consider and to fully consider. And a part of the church's role in this world is to deliberate, to fully uh, consider and to carefully consider what's happening in the cosmos, in the world system. When Jesus says they are not defined by the world system, we have to be a church who's able to deliberate the world's system and not be defined by the world system. That's a part of what it means to be uh, God's ecclesia or the church of God. That means we don't just accept whatever people tell us. That means we don't just accept whatever the politicians would say, whatever's happening in pop culture, whatever's happening, the latest trends in Hollywood, the latest trends on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, what have you, friends. As the church, as the ecclesia, we are not defined by the world's ways and the world's system, the cosmos, but also we're called to deliberate and to carefully judge those things against the truth of God's word because we've been sanctified by the truth of God's word, word. Friends, this is especially true in a culture of lies and lying. It's, it's unfortunate for me to say that, but as we live in a culture of lies, liars, and lying, we have to be sanctified by the truth of God's word, and we have to learn to deliberate. Take a look at Acts chapter 17, verse 12. It says, these were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica. This is talking about the Berean Christians. These were more fair minded than those in Thessalonica. Here's how in that they received the word with all readiness. Very important. And searched the scriptures daily. Search the scriptures. Faith comes by hearing and hearing comes 
by the word of God. Both faith and the ability to hear God come from the word of God. The Bible says that the Bereans here were more fair minded and they searched the scriptures or the word of God, friends, come on, on a daily basis. I, I hope you joined our uh, Bible reading program, friends. This is why we share that Bible reading program, have invited you to join us in reading the word of God every day, friends, because it is biblical. It is scripture for you to search the word daily, not weekly, to search the word on a daily basis, friends, so that we can be more fair minded like the Bereans. Get this. They search the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. The Berean church were deliberators. They were a part of the ecclesia, the council of God's people called out of the world for the purpose of deliberating. And that's what you see happening in the life of the Berean Christians. They search the scriptures daily to find out or to deliberate whether or not these things were so in contrast to the world's systems, the world's system or the world's ways. Verse 12, therefore, many of them believed after they searched the scripture to find out if things were, were so to deliberate. It says, therefore, many of them, to, many of them believed. You could say that they believed they were intelligent with spiritual wisdom and revelation knowledge, not just information, but because they searched the word of God daily to find out if these things were so it brought them into spiritual wisdom and revelation knowledge as they deliberated the scriptures in contrast to the world around them, friends. They were deliberating the truth of God's word, which is a really, really big deal. Let's just say their searching resulted in their sanctification. Their searching resulted in their sanctification. Some of God's people are not sanctified because God's people are not searching. Friends, you have everything to do with your own sanctification because it's connected to you searching the word of God. It results in your sanctification. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is true, but you have a part to play to search the scriptures, which results in your sanctification. Friends, this is really kind of a blockbuster deal that I'm sharing with you, because when I talk about how cultural Christianity is a problem in the church, Paul acknowledges three distinct group of people. Very important. He talks about the Jews. He talks about the Gentiles. But then as a separate entity, separate from Jews and Gentiles, Paul talks about the church of God, the ecclesia. Friends, let's just say that cultural Christians are Gentile Christians. Jews, Paul says, Gentiles, cultural Christians are Gentile Christians. They're Gentile believers. But then Paul talks about a third group, Jews, Gentiles, and let's just say over here, the church of God, the ecclesia, the people who are called out. Jesus says they are not defined by the world's system. God has called them into an assembly. Those saints that are in heaven and also in the earth, the council of God to deliberate Jews and Gentiles. But then there's the church of God, separate and distinct. Jesus says they are no more defined by the world than I'm defined by the world. We have to be the church of God. America needs to see the church of God, the true church of God right now. Friends, listen, to live a lifestyle of faith, we're teaching on a lifestyle of faith. To live a lifestyle of faith, your life must be defined and designed by the word of God. A life that's defined and designed by the word of God. Take a look at Hebrews chapter one, verse two, as we talk about a life that's defined and designed and everything in creation being defined and designed by the word of God. Hebrews chapter one, verse two, speaking of Jesus has in these last days, God is in the last days spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things through whom also he made friends, get this, the world's plural, not the world in terms of planet earth, but it says through whom he made the world's plural, speaking of the entire universe and everything in it. Verse three, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, very important, and upholding all things by the word of his power. The scriptures tell us that Jesus, by his word, is upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Hebrews chapter 11, verse three, by faith, we understand again that the world's again, plural, meaning all the universe, all of creation, every created thing 
By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Friends, if you've done any, if you've done any construction, if you're a general contractor, you understand the importance of that word framed. Friends, it's not talking about a picture frame that you have in your family room. But that term frame, a general contractor understands that before you build a house, before you do construction, you not only need some kind of schematic or blueprints, but friends, you know, the first thing that you do, you have to put up a frame before you put the drywall on, before you paint, uh, before you plaster friends to build or to do construction. You first have to build a frame when you're building an entity, when you're building an F edifice. And the Bible says that by faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. The actual beams, the support columns, the studs, friends, come on. Uh, everything that holds the world together, that holds the, holds the worlds, plural together, the universe, it was built by and it is sustained by the word of God. So when we talk about God's word, how it, it defines us, if we're going to live a lifestyle of faith, it has to be defined and designed by the word of God. That means that God has to uphold all things. Every aspect of your life has to be upheld by the word of God and to be framed by the word of God. Friends, you're talking about the infrastructure of your life. We're teaching on a lifestyle of faith. I'm telling you, friends, that the infrastructure of your life, friends, the framing, the infrastructure of your parenting, your marriage, how you relate to your children, your work ethic, friends, how you manage your finances, how you how you uh, conduct your 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 affairs, friends, how you manage your body, the words that you speak, the thoughts that you uh, you think, friends, how you entertain yourself, friends. I'm telling you, everything in your life is intended to be framed, designed, defined, upheld by the truth of God's word. Remember, Jesus says these are not defined by the cosmos. Friends, don't let the world tell you how to think and function, how to be, what kind of marriage you're supposed to have, what kind of parents. Friends, we don't get that information from the world. We because we live a lifestyle of faith, it's framed in our lives by the word of God. I hope you're tracking with me in the times in which we live. This is vital truth for God's people. Uh, define when we talk about what it means to define, define and design by the word of God. Define means to set forth meaning, but more importantly and more accurately, it means to determine boundaries. Define means to set forth meaning, but more accurately to determine boundaries. When the word of God uh, defines our life, it gives us meaning in life. It tells us our purpose, friends, our calling, what we're here to do, not just to go to work and pay some more bills and retire. And you say you live a good life by the cosmos standards or the world's standards. But it gives us our meaning in life from the heart of God himself. But the word of God, it defines our, li our lives because it determines boundaries for us, friends. Listen, definition states and clarifies what is, but it also clarifies what something is not. Definition declares and defines what something is, but what something is, is not. And you'll really be amazed to see as I look around pastorally, I'm just speaking with the heart of a pastor I'm really amazed to see how many of God's people live undefined lives. Defined means to set forth meaning, but also to set boundaries. So many of God's people live undefined lives. I mean, undefined lives uh, spiritually, and they have inclusive beliefs, friends. Just we just love everybody and everything goes. We're tolerant of everything, friends. That's an undefined uh, spiritual belief system in your life. Many of God's people live undefined. Uh, you can live undefined mentally and just kind of make make choices, have no boundaries, no framework, no pattern of decision making, godly decision making based upon the wisdom of God. That's what happens when you're undefined in your mind. You can be undefined in your emotions, friends. And you know what? You get depressed. You get offended of every, everything. You feel like you're a victim. Uh, even when you're undefined in your emotions, you fall in love with people you should not fall in love that are no good with you. You have relationships and connections with people that you should not be with because you are undefined emotionally, even in terms of how do you interact with people. You can be undefined physically, eating things that you shouldn't eat, doing things that you shouldn't do practicing a lifestyle of sin. That's what it means to be undefined physically. Some folks are undefined uh, financially and they have unnecessary out of control spending. 
They just can't live by a budget. They can't live within their means. They can't handle resources wisely in a way that sets them up for a future and sets their children and their grandchildren up for uh, a positive future, friends, because they are undefined financially, friends. So many people are living undefined lives, and it's the word of God that defines our life to not only give us meaning, friends, but to establish boundaries for our life. Think about it. Definition affirms the fact that this podium is a podium, but it also affirms the fact that this podium is not a chair. Definition tells you what it is, tells you the purpose of it, but definition also tells you what it is not. This is a podium. It's not a chair. That's what definition does, friends. And if you live an undefined life, if you don't define this podium and you think it's a chair, you'll try to sit on it. Even though you can perhaps sit on it, friends, it'll be uncomfortable for you. And you know what? It could even 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 cause great injury to yourself or maybe to other people, friends, when we misuse or abuse something because we have not focused on definition. So many of God's people are living undefined lives and they're abusing themselves. They're being abused by the devil and they're being used to abuse other people because of a lack of definition in their lives. Remember, Jesus makes that statement from the uh, message translation. They are not defined by the world, by the world's way of things, doing things just like I'm not defined by the world. But our lives are to be upheld by and framed and defined by the word of God. This is what it means to live a lifestyle of faith. When we talk about lifestyle, lifestyle is defined by your habits, your beliefs, your values, attitudes, preferences, education, your moral standards, friends, we're undefined uh, morally in America right now. That's what that's what we call. Let me say it this way. Gender fluidity. That's just undefined gender. It's, it can be whatever you think it is, whatever you feel like it is, friends. We're under we have undefined moral standards, uh, letting people decide for themselves. Uh, lifestyle includes economic capability, physical possessions, relationships, all of those things that constitute your mode of living. Everybody is living some kind of mode of living and each mode can be categorized as righteous or unrighteous based upon the truth of God's word. Very quickly, Matthew chapter nine, verse 28 concerning lifestyle and how do you live a lifestyle by faith? A very important principle that Jesus communicates to us in verse 28. And when he had come into the house, the blind men came to him and Jesus said to them, do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, according to your faith, let it be to you. According to your faith, let it be to you. Verse 30. And their eyes were open. Jesus sternly warned them, saying, see that no one knows it. Jesus says, if you believe that I can do it, he says, according to your faith, let it be to you, friends. And I want to tell you, when it comes to defining your lifestyle, According to your faith, let it be to you what kind of lifestyle you are going to live by faith, friends, as as to whether or not the word of God defines, designs and frames the infrastructure of your lifestyle. Friends, you can live as godly of a life as you want to live by faith. Jesus says, according to your faith, he says, let it be to you. You know what we do in this society today when we live an undefined spiritual life, friends? Uh, you know what? We blame everybody else for the way that we live. You know, we I, I'm this way because of the white people, because of the black people. And it's because of the Democrats. It's because of the Republicans, friends. You know, it's the man. It's the system. And friends, we'll come up with a list of uh, reasons and excuses. Friends, you can talk about these issues for the rest of your life, deliberating about the vaccine and the virus and all this chatter that's going on. Friends, I'm telling you, we live. We can talk about those things until we die but Jesus says, you know what? At some point, you got to start talking faith and you have to make a decision to define your life by faith. According to your faith, let it be to you, friends, not according to somebody else's faith or the government's faith. I don't let the government, I don't let any politician have faith for me. They don't have faith for me. I have faith for myself because Jesus says, according to your faith, not their faith, let it be to you, friends. Listen, lifestyle is very, very important. It is possible to have God given dreams for your life while living a lifestyle that contradicts your dreams an undefined lifestyle that contradicts your dreams. All dreams have corresponding definitions and disciplines. 
Friends, if God is going to uh, fulfill your dreams, if you're going to see your God given dreams fulfilled, you know what? There are corresponding definitions and disciplines that go along with every dream. And in so many cases, again, just pastorally over the years, I see this, that folks have dreams for their life from the Lord. But their lifestyle is a contradiction to the very dream that God has given them, because although they have the dream, they lack the definition and they lack the disciplines in their lifestyle to see to it that that dream, friends, becomes a reality in their life. Or you could say living out their purpose, friends, you want to say you got got a goal to lose some weight. You dream of losing weight, friends, but you keep eating junk food and you don't have the discipline uh, to work out. You hate exercise, friends. But then guess what? You have a dream that one day you're going to get in that suit. You're going to get in that dress. One day you're going to get in that thing again, friends. I'm telling you that your lifestyle, if it contradicts your dream, it ain't happening, folks. If you left the the definition, if you lack the definition and the discipline associated with that dream, friends, you're never going to get in that suit. You're never going to get in that 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 uh, that dress again, friends. So just just give it away, friends. That's a practical example of why your, your uh, definitions and disciplines in life have to line up with your dreams. Uh, this is something that Eastern religions practice. Let's just say, I think, much more faithfully than we do here in the West with our rights. And, uh, you know, we just have all of our freedoms and all of our liberties that more or less in the Eastern religions, friends, their lifestyle is married to their faith. What they believe, even if it's an idol God or a false religion, their faith, friends, it defines their disciplines and their lifestyles uh, completely, friends. What they believe is defined by uh, what they believe spiritually or by their faith. And so we're going to see here there are six um, possessions, things that we have to have in the book of Hebrews uh, in chapter 10 that we have to have if we're going to practice a lifestyle of faith. Just a little bit of history about uh, some overview about Hebrews. Um, Hebrews is a very encouraging book. I had it in my heart to encourage you this morning. It's an encouraging book, a book of encouragement. It was written to Messianic Jews who, because of their suffering, they were in danger of falling away from the faith, giving up their lifestyle of faith. Hebrews is a great book to study right now after quarantine. With all the discouragement and depression in the world, I encourage you to study um, the book of Hebrews. Forty years after Jesus had been crucified, the people were disappointed that Jesus had not yet returned. And the writer of Hebrews seeks to convince the people that they had made the right choice in serving Jesus and they needed to persevere by faith. Very important terms. And so Hebrews chapter one up until the verse chapter 10 or so, um, it talks about the superior ministry of Jesus. But beginning at verse 19, it begins to explain how believers should respond to the superior ministry of Jesus. So therefore, in response, it starts by saying, therefore, or in response to the superior ministry of Jesus, friends, Six things we have to have. Number one is this. We must have boldness. We must have boldness. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. Friends, this verse of scripture tells us that through the blood of Jesus, We are entitled to boldly enter God's presence, to boldly enter God's presence, fearlessly accessing all that he has and all that he is without hesitation or reservation. Friends, we have to know that we have boldness to come before our father in heaven, friends, to leave society, to disconnect from society and to enter into the presence of God. Remember, as the ecclesia the sanctified people by the word of God, those who are called out of the culture into a council to deliberate, friends. We become the ecclesia and we have boldness, friends, not timidity, to come out of the world, to come out of the cosmos and to enter into the presence of God, friends. It takes boldness to leave the world. It takes boldness to give up the world's way of thinking. Come on, friends. All of these socio-political ideologies, friends, and all of the chatter that's happening in society, it takes boldness for you to leave that and to enter into the presence, friends, get this uh, through the into into the holiest, holiest by the blood of Jesus. It takes boldness to do that, to leave the world and to come into God's presence and to go down this new and this living way, which he consecrated for us, friends. Boldness can be identified either in disposition or in your confession, friends, things that you say, but also in your 
posture in life. You can see it in the life of a believer. Hebrews 4, 16. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. It takes boldness to leave the world and to leave the world system to enter into the presence of God. Proverbs 28, 1 says the wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are bold as a lion, friends. Come on. Think about the last time that you saw a lion, friends, scampering away from some other creature because it's afraid. Friends, really, you don't see it because lions have boldness. They seem to be fearless, uh, friends, in their ability to defend themselves. And so lions are bold. And the word of God says that righteous people, the godly people, friends, the ecclesia, we have to be as bold as a lion, friends. The, the wicked flees when no one pursues, friends. I'm not running because there's no wickedness in my life. And there's no need for us to run, friends, when we're living righteously before the Lord. Look at Acts chapter 4, verse 28. Very important in the life of the early church. It says to do whatever your hand, whatever God's hand and your purpose determined before to be done. You're talking about God's purpose being predetermined that God's purpose is going to be done. Every president, every governor, every mayor, every senator and congressman, friends, everybody needs to read this verse to understand that God's determined purpose is going to be done in light of that. Verse 29. Now, Lord, look on their threats. Speaking of the government, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness, they may speak your word, friends, that word that sanctifies us. The early church was having some problems with government persecution. And they said, Lord, look at the threats. The government are making threats against us. Look at their threats and says, Lord, grant us that with all boldness, we'll speak your word. Friends, I got some news for you. This is this is my prayer right now. And for every true Christian, this need to be your prayer, because at some point. Come on, folks. When, not if, but when the government threats begin to come. Remember, Jesus says the godless society hates them because I gave gave them my word. Folks, I'm telling you, the true church is written in scripture is going to come under persecution from the government. I see some things that are happening in government today, friends. I believe the process has already started and Christians need to be aware when you're voting and supporting politicians, all these things, friends. I believe that process of government Persecution has already started and the early church said, Lord, we're praying that you give us boldness, that when they begin to threaten us, give us boldness, that we would be true to your word, to speak your word um, with all boldness, friends, with no fear. We have to have boldness during these times. Number two, we must have a high priest. We must have a high priest if we're going to live a lifestyle of faith in today's time. Hebrews 10, 21 and having a high priest over the house of God. He's over the house of God. That's not that's why I'm not worried about. I never worry about inside church. I'm never worried about the church of Jesus Christ universally because Jesus is high priest over the house of God. He's responsible for it all as we continue to seek him and to yield to his leading friends concerning the high priest in Jewish culture. You need to know this. The high priest was not only the spiritual leader, but the supreme civil head of the people. He was distinguished from all other priests in his character, conduct, consecration, and his dress and his duties. He was mediated between God and man. He represented the entire nation. He was the nation's advocate before God and God's spokesman to the nation. He was arrayed in glory and beauty. He, he, he discerned what was the will of God. He prophesied. He paid the price not only for his sins, but for the sins of the people. And his most important function was entering into the presence behind the veil on the day of atonement to satisfy the wrath of God and ensure God's blessing on the people. Friends, I've got good news for you. All of what we just read, Jesus himself is our high priest, which is why we can live, friends, a lifestyle of faith because we have a high priest over the house of God, which includes you. Just a few more scriptures. Hebrews uh, 2, 17 from the New King James Version. Therefore, in all things, he had he had to be made like his brethren, like us. You know, Hebrews 2, 11 says that uh, both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are one. For which reason 
he is not ashamed to call them brethren, friends. And so it says that he had to Jesus had to be made like us, like the brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Hebrews chapter four, verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who passed, who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Let us hold fast our faith. Verse 15, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Hebrews chapter seven, verse 24, friends, you see how the book of Hebrews, I said again, is an encouraging book. All of this is included in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter seven, verse 24 says this. But he, because he continues forever, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood, an unchangeable priesthood that even though life is filled, life is filled with all kinds of changes. The word says that his priesthood is unchangeable. Verse 25. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them for such a high priest was fitting. Friends, get this for us. We have a high priest. We can live a lifestyle of faith because such a high priest was fitting for us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, sanctified, hagiazo, set apart. We read that in John chapter 17, verse 17, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Jesus himself was separate from sinners. Come on. He loved sinners. He died for sinners. But friends, the Bible says he was separate from sinners, even though he ate with them and drank with them. He was separate from them. He was not like them. Very important, friends, because sometimes Christians think to go out and kind of win Christians, uh, win non-believers. You got to be like them, friends. You can't be like sinners. You can spend time with sinners and love on them and, and serve them and be a blessing to them. But the Bible says that Jesus was separate from sinners, even though he died for them. He ate with them and he spent time for them. He came to give his life for them, but he was separate from them in terms of his holiness, friends. He was separate from sinners and has become higher than the heavens. Hebrews chapter nine, verse 11. One more says, but Christ has, uh, came as high priest of the good things to come. He came as high priest of good things to come, friends. Do you believe this? Jesus said, according to your faith. Let it be to you, friends. I know the world is going to offer you and offer me a whole lot of bad stuff all the time. We hear bad news every day. But you have a decision as to whether or not you're going to receive that bad news, friends, because Jesus is high priest of good things to come for you, not bad things. He's high priest of good things. But Jesus says, do you believe this? According to your faith, let it be to you, friends. Uh, number three, what do we have to have? To live a lifestyle of faith, we must have holiness. We must have holiness during the days in which we live. Sanctify them by your truth. Hagiazo, that means holiness. Hebrews 10, 22, let us draw near. James says to draw near to God. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled or cleansed from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. What a picture of internal and external cleansing. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil, con evil conscience and our bodies washed, both our heart and our bodies washed with pure water. Friends, that's internal holiness that's being lived out and expressed externally in a lifestyle of faith, friends. Practicing sin will, will always undermine your capacity to be in intimate relationship with God, friends. Just the shame and the guilt. You, you'll never get close to God practicing sin. You cannot get close to him. Uh, take a look at Psalm 66, verse 17 from the New Living Translator. Lation, it says, I cried out to him for help, praising him as I spoke. Verse 18, if I had not confessed the sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. Friends, we need our prayers answer right now. We need God listening. I don't know about you, friends. I need God listening to me right now because I cry as I cry out to him for help. I need him to listen to me. But the word of God says that if I had not confessed sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened, friends. We've got to uh, be free from sin so that we can enter into intimacy with the Lord. We have to have holiness. Number four, 
the fourth thing we have to have to live a lifestyle of faith, we must have hope. We must have hope. Verse 23, Hebrews chapter 10. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope. Very important. Without wavering. Hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. That's the issue for us in most situations. We waver in our hope. Sometimes we're hopeful. Sometimes we're hopeless. The Bible is saying you've got to learn to be consistently hopeful with no times and no moments of hopelessness, but to be hopeful without wavering for he who promised is faithful. In other words, we shouldn't waver because God never wavers. We shouldn't waver because God is faithful. That means he never waver. He never wavers. Friends, hope is the anticipation of something good. We just talked about Jesus being the high priest of good things to come. Hope is anticipation of something good. And you got to hold fast unto your hope without wavering, friends, to keep on anticipating and believe, believing that something good is going to happen to you because you have a high priest of good things to come, friends. I know things may be hard right now. It's been a tough year. It's been a tough stretch, friends. But you know what? You got to keep hoping, hoping you can't waver in your hope. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse one, faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. That means that we see hope by faith. You can't see hope in the natural. Your circumstances may look hopeless, but you see hope by faith. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. You could say that faith is how you're going to get it, but hope is what you get. And faith is the reality of what we hope for. Look at the faith of Abraham. Romans chapter four, verse 18. One of my favorite passages in the Bible from the New Living Translation concerning hope says that even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping, believing that he would become the father of many nations. Here why. Here's why. For God had said he had a word from God. Sanctify them by your truth, friends. It's in the word of God. And I'm telling you that when you hold on to the word of God, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Friends, you're always hearing messages of hope from the Lord and not messages of hopelessness from the Lord. Abraham had a word, friends. Two more here. We must have church. If we're going to live a lifestyle of faith, we must have church. Hebrews 10, 24. And let us consider, which means to think carefully about. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching friends. Take a look at this. Consider, think carefully about one another to stir up love and good works. You know what? You know what that word stir up there? It literally means to provoke or even to irritate friends. Isn't, isn't it true that some of the people you love most are the people that are most irritable? to us because they have greater access and greater intimacy in our lives. And it says that in the context of love in the church, that God's people in a loving church should irritate you and should stir you up or irritate or provoke you to do good works. Friends, this is why you need to be in the church to live a lifestyle of faith, because even when you don't feel it and you don't think it, even when it's offensive to you, God put you in the right place with some people who love you to provoke you or irritate you to do right, to irritate you to do good, friends, to keep calling you out, to keep uh, telling you that you're wrong and you need to change. And you say, these people are irritating me. But you know what? God, exactly. That's exactly why God put them there, friends, to irritate you to good works, to do what's right. This is one of the most important parts of being in a church community, friends, is being offended in a good way by people who love you so that you can change. But you know what? Most people can't stand the offense. And they leave. They abandon the church, friends, because they can't stand the irritation that is assigned by God. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves. That's the ecclesia, friends. Very important. But exhorting one another. That term exhorting is the Greek term parakaleo. Exhorting one another. Parakaleo. Friends, you know what? That word is the same term that's used regarding the person of the Holy Spirit. So exhorting one another is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit uses other believers to help and to comfort you, 
to provoke you, to irritate you, friends. Well, you know, I have the Holy Spirit all by myself, Pastor James. No, you don't. You, you cannot have the Holy Spirit by yourself. Sure, you can be filled with the Holy Spirit, but to have the work of the Holy Spirit, the parakaleo in your life, friends, you have to be in community because that same Holy Spirit uses other people that love you, that God has placed in your life, friends, to do that work of provoking you and irritating you. It's exhorting one another. It's the ministry of the Holy Spirit so much more as we see the day approaching. Uh, Hebrews 10, 24 from the New Living Translation says, let us think, let us let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Verse 24 from the message translation says, let's see how inventive we can be in encouraging love and helping out. Verse 24 from um, uh, let's just see the passion translation. It says, discover creative ways to encourage others and to motivate them toward acts of compassion, doing beautiful works as expressions of love. Discover creative ways to encourage others and to motivate them. That same verse from the Living Bible says, in response to all he has done for us, let us outdo each other in being helpful and kind to each other in doing good. Friends, that's our desire is to uh, outdo each other friends at Insight Church and doing good. I, I want to outdo you. I'm, I'm just going to go on record and say, I'm not going to let you outdo me and outserve me and out love me, friends. I'm going to love you more than you love me, friends. That's the attitude we should all have in our church community, in our faith community, friends. We Just 120 folks that are stirred up, that were stirred up on the day of Pentecost, changed the world, friends. I think 120 people stirred up is better than a a church of 12,000 people who are not stirred up, friends. God only needed 120 people stirred up. Look at this quote from John Wesley talking about being stirred up. He says this, give me 100 preachers. This is the founder of the Methodist movement. He says, give me 100 preachers who fear nothing but sin and desire nothing but God. And I care not a straw, whether they be clergymen or laymen, such alone will shake the gates of hell and set up the kingdom of heaven on earth, friends. That's a picture of what it means to stir up one another, friends, for love and good works in the context of the ecclesia and why we must not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, friends. The last must have. Number six is this. We must have endurance. We must have endurance, friends. Times are really, really tough right now. And if you're going to live a lifestyle of faith and if you're going to make it, let's just say you got to have endurance. Hebrews 10, verse 36. For you have need of endurance so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise, friends. Endurance means stamina, lasting power, your ability to bear pain and resist fatigue. Very important definition. Stamina, lasting power, your ability to bear pain and resist fatigue, friends. How much pain can you take, friends? Success is always determined by how much you can take, how much pain you can take, friends. This, I'm telling you, from a corporate standpoint, in any situation in life, a discipline with an ath athlete, friends, listen, in every area of life, your success is determined by how much pain you can take and whether or not you have the ability to resist fatigue. I'm telling you that successful Christianity it's all about whether or not you have the ability to bear pain and to, and to maintain stamina and lasting power. That root word is derare, which means to be hard and permanently fixed like a statue. If God says we need endurance, friends, come on, then guess what? We need it. I need it. At a minimum, everybody thinks about quitting, friends. And you know what's true? Some people quit. Some people don't quit. We are destined to receive all that God has for us if we continue and have endurance. I sometimes say that the hardest thing to do in life is to not quit. It's a mistake to think that you have all the endurance that you need. The word of God says you have need. No matter where we are, you have need of endurance, friends. And you know what? You don't know how much endurance you need until you are ready to quit. When you're, when you're let's just say, when you go to, the, when you first get to the gym and you have energy, you know what you don't need? You don't need endurance when you have energy when you first get to the gym. You need endurance at the end of the workout when you have no, no energy left, friends. That's when you need endurance. Friends, you never discover how much endurance that you need until you're tired and you're ready to quit. 
And this is the word of the Lord, friends, because I know many of God's people are tired and you're ready to quit. You may have already quit God's word for you. You have need of endurance. You need stamina. You need the ability to resist, uh, to bear pain and to resist f- fatigue, friends. Um, very, very important for us to understand. Many, many Christians haven't trained for this world that we're living in right now, and they don't have the endurance that they need. Let's read a few more verses of scripture here. Hebrews chapter 12, verse one from the message translation says, do you see what this means? All these pioneers who blazed away, all these veterans cheering us on. It means we'd better get on with it, strip down, start running and never quit. No extra spiritual fat, no parasitic sins. Verse two, keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished this race we're in. Study how he did it because he never lost sight of where he was headed. That exhilarating finish in and with God, he could put up with anything along the way. Cross, shame, whatever. He was not a victim, and now he's there in the place of honor, right alongside God. It says that Jesus could put up with anything along the way, friends. We've got to let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. We need to have the mind of Christ, which means we can put up with anything, friends, because we have endurance. 1 Corinthians 15, 57, New King James Version, it says, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, because we already have the victory, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding, which means doing more and not less in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Verse 58 from the message translation. I love this. Love how this reads. Take a look with me. Last verse of scripture here. With all this going on, my dear, dear friends, stand your ground and don't hold back. Listen, throw yourselves into the work of of the master, confident that nothing you do for him is a waste of time or effort. Friends, throw yourself into the work of the master. I want to speak to somebody that needs to rebound. You've given up, you quit, you sit on the, you're sitting on the sidelines because you lack endurance and you lack stamina. You've been hurt, you've been offended, you've been disappointed, friends. The Bible says that Jesus could handle whatever happened, whatever came his way. It says he could handle it, friends. The word of God says you have need of endurance. You need the ability to resist pain and to bear fatigue, friends. Even with those who have irritated you, stirred you up in the house of God, friends. The Bible tells us that we have to be renewed. Our inner man is renewed day by day. Take a look at this last principle, friends. You may be exhausted, but you cannot exhaust the all-sufficient grace of God, which can only be received by faith. You may be exhausted, but you cannot exhaust the all sufficient grace of God, which you can only, which can only be received by faith. Friends, I tell folks all the time that burnout means one thing. It means that you're operating in your own strength and not operating in the grace of God. Anytime you feel and burned out, it's an indicator that you are not operating in the grace of God because his grace is sufficient that you may be exhausted, but you cannot exhaust the grace of God, which is all sufficient for your life. Friends, I just want to pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I speak your blessing over everyone that is listening to me. And Lord, I pray, Lord, that faith would arise in our heart because we have a high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses. Jesus knows what it's like to go through COVID and to go through the tough times and quarantine and to be separated from the church and all of the problems and the challenges and the issues that are, so, that are associated with the world right now. Thank you, Jesus, that you understand and you sympathize with our weakness. And Father, I just speak, um, Lord, as we're set apart from the world system, Lord God, and not defined by the world. I thank you, Lord God, that you give us endurance, that you grant us endurance. We receive it by faith, Lord. I speak strength over your people, Lord God. Thank you that you give power to the weak and to those who have no might. He increases strength in Jesus' mighty name. We thank you. Amen and amen.